Isla Crown often fell through puddles of stars and into faraway places, always without permission, and seemingly on the worst occasions. Well, here we are. We're back at it again. Welcome once again to a completely normal meeting of the St. Balasar University's English Club. I'm Andrew. Order. Order. Club is in session. And I'm Joshua. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I was so worried. You're worried about the, who that character might turn out to be, huh? <laughs> <laughs> don't know who you were going for i was like wait was there a judge in this book <laughs> so much happens that i was sure something might have slipped through the cracks wait you don't remember gavel gavinson the judge character <laughs> shut up that's exactly what alex astor would have named a judge <laughs> but anyways uh welcome to the english club podcast we are real life critique partners and we've made it our mission to try to give these books the shot that they deserve we believe very strongly that every writer has their own vision, and we take the books as they are, not as we want them, and try to improve them on their own terms. Uh, we're not above making fun of uh, Empress Teresa or a trigger warning, but we also think that there's, you know, there's something to these books that could, you know, given the right guidance, grow into a real narrative. So if you've listened to our past couple episodes, we had done kind of a split custody situation with our books, Ready Player One and Gothicana. We had both read only one half and the other had read the other, and we tried to meet in the middle somehow. We are back to our normal formula because Light Lark by Alex Astor was submitted to us for review, and we just had to give it the complete look over we're so excited to dive in alex i think you are the ideal english club member you honestly remind me a lot of lanny serum you remind me a lot of myself too everything about your writing process and the book that you have presented for us i can see and i can feel and it, it just makes me so excited to dive into this yeah this is absolutely like an english club core book um, it reminds me so much, Andrew, of the books that we used to get when we were in real life English club back in undergrad. Yes. Um, the novels that people would send in and want us to like fix whole cloth because this has such an interesting combination of complete newbie mistakes and then like more interesting uh, plot and character based flaws that, you know, if fixed could potentially turn this from a trash fire into an interesting novel. And I think it was a good call on this one to have us both read the entire thing, because whoever ended up getting the second half would have been totally screwed. You would be missing literally all of the necessary context to understand what was happening. And the person who read the first half would basically have read nothing. It's all just <laughs> yes. like random bullshit happening. Um so yeah, we, we both really had to read the whole thing on this one. On a quick housekeeping note, uh, shout out to Life Sword. That's one word, two eyes in life on Instagram. He DM'd us months ago and I only just saw it recently. Check out her art. Check out her work, uh, Project Heaven Sent, linked in her bio. Really nice person. We actually had this animated discussion about Light Lark when I posted that I was reading it. This is not a sponsorship or a share for share. She's just a great artist, and I feel really bad for having accidentally ignored her. While we're shouting out social media, I also want to shout out our Twitter, which is at English Club Podcast. I run that while Andrew runs the Instagram. And yeah, if you want to give us a follow over there, try to post, you know, regularly enough. Keep it funny. Keep it light. Keep it fruity. That's one of the places you can send us book recommendations if you have them. Yeah, absolutely. I never would have thought to read Light Lark had people on YouTube not been commenting about it. So absolutely keep that coming. We are listening. We want to have a community where we interact with the people that love our stuff and uh, like our work. And we've also gotten some good critique from from listeners in the past, um, not just about like the half and half structure we've been trying out, but about other things as well. And we're doing our best to incorporate that as we're recording more and more episodes so yeah please do keep that stuff coming we're listening all right alex you know what the deal is did you listen to the new gus dapperton album i did not
Not since the event. Guess who features? Guess who features on the outro? Oh, I know who features on it. <laughs> Our best friend in the whole world, Ocean Vuong, is featured at the end of Gus Dapperton's new album. I was flabbergasted. I was floored. Both of these people are my mortal enemies. I used to love Gus Dapperton, but then like some friends of mine uninvited me to a concert that they were going to for him. And I, ever since then, I just can't listen to him. But to be fair, Ocean Vuong's poetry in that outro is actually pretty good. I would love to hear what you have to say about it, Joshua. Oh, about Ocean Vuong's poetry? No, I like his work. I mean, I know you arbitrarily hate it uh, as like this for the same reasons that you arbitrarily hate Gus Dapperton, but I think Ocean Vuong's a great <laughs> I poet. I just didn't like, <laughs> I didn't like On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. I loved Time as a Mother, okay, which is enough. weird because Time as a Mother is purely poetry and On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous is... Uh, like prose technically i think you have an aversion to things that like wear the prose label but aren't like clearly prose maybe so <laughs> which is not not understandable okay 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 andrew is failing to do a segue here so i'll do it um i'll segue we're segging our ways right now the way it's segging let me tell you what Shut up. uh <laughs> so um we've had a couple of books now that have sort of like used the tarot aesthetic to greater and lesser <clears throat> runic's levels of effectiveness <laughs> and um so i've been learning to read tarot just for the hell of it makes for a good party trick or whatever so i thought i would do a little tarot reading so hit me with it Let, what's your question that i had you prepare before the podcast what will the twist of lanny Sarum's sequel to handbook for mortals be okay i'm shuffling right now i'm imbuing the cards with your energies Okay, so Tarot is actually really bad at answering, like, specific questions about, like, future events because all the cards are based around, like, broad themes like spirituality, financial success, intellect, emotional independence slash dependence, masculinity, femininity, whatever. Um, but I can still draw a couple of cards and see if they get the themes right, which will be revealed, I guess, not at the end of this episode, but whenever Landy Sarum's second book comes out. Please, Landy Sarum, please release your second book. I need to know what happens to Jackson. Lanny! Lanny! <laughs> <laughs> this is the second time we've mentioned this. Lanny, I hope you're listening. Lanny, I'll die if you don't tell me what happens to Jackson. <laughs> you um, don't want Joshua to die, do you? All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to draw two cards. Okay. And hope that their uh, synergetic alchemies combine to give us the themes <laughs> that we need. I'm drawing the first card. It's the Page of Cups reversed. Okay. Interesting. 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 The second card is also reversed. It's the Four of Cups reversed. So the Page of Cups, this is a character card. It's also a card in the Minor Arcana. The page is usually a character that's at the beginning of some kind of emotional journey or awakening. It's Ooh. a character who is set out optimistically. Um, it's generally a positive card. But because it's reversed, that usually means a bad thing. So in this case, I'm reading this card as akin to like the fool uh, reversed, which means that there's been some kind of false start or some kind of naivete is getting in the way of a successful start to this journey of emotional growth. We know that's true. That could be true. I could see that being true based on kind of the themes of uh, Lanny's first book. Then the Four of Cups reversed. This is a card I'm not as familiar with. Usually this card has to do with boredom or aloofness <laughs> um, those are the major themes of this card when it's reversed apparently so this card indicates that in a search for something meaningful you have perhaps been led to ignore the potential happiness that is given to you okay so this is kind of a not seeing the forest for the trees situation which i think actually gels really well with the reversed page of cups so what it sounds like to me is that this uh, novel is actually going to end with a kind of, like, false beginning, if that makes sense. Like, you remember when movies were doing part one and part two a lot? Mm -hmm. Like, they did that with, like, The Last Harry Potter or whatever? Yeah. I, I suspect that the second book, based on this reading, is gonna do that. Or, like, the end of the second book is really the start of the third book, and it doesn't really resolve anything on its own. Okay, so... I think the twist is that it yet again does not end. <laughs> <laughs> How could I have seen that coming? Oh, man. <laughs> All right. We're kind of stalling because both of us are dreading summarizing Light Lark by Alex Astor. Uh, I ask you, I beg you on bended knee, please bear with us because so much happens in this book. So that was why he had commanded that all the hearths remain lit, 
why there were so many torches across the mainland and fire in nearly every room of the castle. They were all masking the king's weakness. He stepped on the stairs, putting him at their level. I hope you see now why it is more important than ever to figure out and fulfill the prophecy. The king motioned to the wall. Words began to be carved along the stone in large, fire-coated letters. The Oracle's Riddle, the one Isla had been taught years prior, the key to breaking the curses. Only joined can the curses be undone, only after one of six has won, when the original offense has been committed again, and a ruling line has come to an end. Only then can history amend. So for club members, I'm going to start the summary not with a summary of actual events in the book, because in order to understand the events of the book, you need to understand the foundational lore, which is explained to you throughout the book. Now, if that sounds like good secondary world building, as in not info dumping all at the beginning, um, you have been tricked by me organizing this into a coherent order of information. In the novel, the absolutely necessary foundational elements to understanding the world are sprinkled in, some of them as late as more than a third into the book. So like the whole conceit, this main contest is underway and we're still getting things that we should have known like way, way, way earlier. Okay, so I'm going to start with the rules of the world, right? Okay, so there's a cluster of islands that all the countries used to live on. This whole area is called Lightlark. But also, the central island is called Lightlark. Then there's islands that surround it. Each one is named after the people that live there. So there's like Moon Isle, Sky Isle, Wild Isle, Star Isle, etc. Okay, 500 years ago, someone, no one knows who it was, somehow, cursed the islands and their people. Each race got a different curse that attempts to be ironic. So for example, sunlings, who have like fire powers, can't go out during the day now, thanks to this curse, or they'll just die. So it's like, oh, what an ironic twist. Every 100 years, the storm that cuts off the island chain vanishes for 100 days, so the rulers of each island can meet and participate in a game. But it's not a game. It's just called a game. And attempt to break the curses. This event is called the Centennial. It's more like a meeting. A series of meetings. Yeah. So you're probably wondering, where do they live now if they don't live on Lightlark slash the island chain known as Lightlark? They each live on what are called Newlands, which are like islands that the people fled to, which are outside the storm, uh, when the curses were cast, right? So the wildlings now live somewhere else, the moonlings live somewhere else, the skylings live somewhere else, not inside the storm. However, there are members of each race that still live on Lightlark and on their respective island on the Lightlark island chain, with a couple exceptions. So the wildlings, for example, all left, every single one. There are no wildlings left on Lightlark or the Lightlark Island chain, except for the ones that appear for a random twist that is not explained. Yes. So, <laughs> anyway, there's a prophecy about how to break the curse. We don't learn who said it until three quarters of the way through the book. And it turns out to be a nameless oracle lady who lives in a frozen fountain, like in fucking Legend of Zelda, the faces of evil. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, they go up and interact with her and she unfreezes and she's like, help, Ganon froze the fountain. I'm stuck. Literally, it's like Zelda CDI, uh, basically word for word. <laughs> so basically, she has this prophecy that she made up, and it tells how to break the curse, but it's so vague that it's literally useless, and it only makes sense in hindsight, right? So like, there's a part of the book where they're trying to guess what the parts of prophecy mean, and they can't figure it out, and then a thing makes itself clear, and then retroactively, Isla is like, oh my god, the prophecy made sense the whole time! And it's like, well, if it made so much sense, then why didn't it help you? <laughs> okay. Now, Andrew, um, pop quiz for you. I built this into my summary because I thought it'd be funny if you got it wrong. Okay. List all the curses. All right. So sunlings cannot be in the sunlight. Okay. Gr not Grimshaws. Um, nightshades. <laughs> Grimshaws. Nightshades cannot be in the night. Night? Can they not be in the night? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank God. I'm so good at this. Um, wildlings have to subsist off of human hearts. And that might be it. They also have to kill whoever they fall in love with. Yeah, but that's dumb. But um, it's true. Anyways, okay. where am I? Moonlings have to go into hiding on the full moon 
because the sea will attack them. Yes, correct. Is that right? Okay, I thought I was being facetious. Holy crap. Um, Starlings cannot live past 25 years old. Okay. Because as we all know, 25 years is very important to the life cycle of a star. Yep, it's true. That's when they get the right to vote. Source, it is known. (laughs) You're forgetting Skyling. Skyling, okay. Azul did nothing, come on, okay. Okay, okay, you're not gonna believe this. So Skylings, their only power is to fly. Their curse was, now they can't do that anymore. I forgot about that! <laughs> Wait, so they didn't get an- everyone lost their powers, but like, so Skyling just didn't get the extra curse? Yeah, well, they can still kind of airbend a little bit, but they their main thing was flying, and now they just can't ah. do that. So they're basically normal people- with airbending powers, which like, oh, boo-hoo. Right. <laughs> so if these sound like really unbalanced and also like not totally clear, that's because they're not. For example, in the Wildlings case, when it says subsist only on human hearts, it's like, what happens if they eat things that are not human hearts? Like, does it turn to ash in their mouth? Do they get sick? We don't know. Because Isla, our one wildling main character, is it, it doesn't have the curse because she doesn't have powers. And you don't have the curse if you don't have powers. So um, it's just sort of like really unclear like what the actual rules are, how this works. Like Also, like what does it mean to fall in love? Is love the moment that they have sex for the first time? Is it like the moment they get married? It's also not clear when the curse says they turn into like wild monsters that like kill their lovers. Like what happens? Like do they actually transform? I thought that was poetic. Do they really turn into monsters or do they just like lose control and sanity and start going crazy? Well, we know they don't totally lose their sanity because the whole reason Isla doesn't have powers is because her mom refused to like, quote unquote, give in to the curse or whatever. And so Uh died in the process of childbirth. And then also Isla was born without powers as like recompense for her mom not having obeyed the rules of the curse, which is like, if you can choose to just not obey the rules, it's not really a curse it's more just like a law like a magic law i don't know so anyway now i'm going to get into like the powers that each race does have or at least some of them so despite the curse each race has a unique power set for example the moonlings can water bend and heal and then the ruler of each nation is just best at their magic whatever that is like they're just automatically the best at it yeah so like Celeste, who is the queen of the starlings, uh, their their power is, like, making energy weapons and stuff, and so she's the best at, like, shooting laser beams. So, if the ruler of a certain nation dies during the centennial, all of their people also die. Right. And the rulers know that to break the curse, one of them is going to have to die. So genocide appears to be unavoidable. They just have to pick... Which gene gets cited. Yeah. And, like, the eugenicist, like, undertones of this novel never really go fully addressed. Like, there's a part where Isla, like, dresses as other races by dyeing her hair. So apparently, like, everybody of a certain... And changing her clothes. And changing her clothes. So apparently everybody of, like, certain races, like, has these certain traits. So it's not clear if these are, like, ethnicities or races or cultures or what. It sounds like races, which then raises the question for me, if she's dyeing her hair and trying to dress like this race to... I don't know, ape their whole deal. Is that like horribly insensitive? I don't understand the the meaning of this, like the depth of it. And we don't ever find out because she just disguises herself and does the thing. Anyway, so the king of Light Lark, like I said, has all of the other powers and, but not their curses. He's an origin. Yeah, he's also an origin, which is like one of the first people. So he's like a billion years old or whatever. Um, God, this is already so much. There's a ton of magical relics and enchantments. Uh, just sort of around the world. It's, I don't know, it's like an Elden Ring or something. There's like little <laughs> things that just have their own rules yeah. and they get explained and then forgotten about as the plot needs to explain and forget about them. Like, for example, there's this certain relic that the characters are looking for that'll come up in the course of the summary that like they think has one rule set, but actually there's another rule set and the rules just change to suit the plot. It's really a mess. And then people who fall in love with each other are able to use each other's powers if they're from different like races slash nations. Oh, right. But... Yeah. Hold on here. Any children they have will have just one power set. So if you're like, um, say, a Skyling and you have a kid with a Sunling, your kid will either be a Sunling or a Skyling. It seems like it's random. And then I guess your kid will just be like divergented into the <laughs> country that suits their power set because there's never any talk of like Skylings who live on Moon Isle, for example, and like 
have Moonling family and so live half the year on Moonling and then half the year on Skyling. So I don't know what the deal is here, is my point. Alex, I would love for you to clear this up because I feel like some of this was not intended and it adds additional questions that distract from the central questions of the narrative. Andrew, I've talked a lot. Can you help me out? There had been no warning, no time to change. That was how Isla had ended up in the freezing snow globe that the stadium had been turned into, in nothing but a tank top and tiny shorts. Her outfits are always so completely revealing, but at the same time, she has like 17 daggers in every single one. Yes, yes, and also, um, when was the tank top invented? Not to nitpick. Well, there's a part where she was a sweater too. So it's like, she wears a sweater. Yeah, there's a part where oh she's wearing God. like a long sleeve sweater and like being all mopey. I don't remember. That. <laughs> You're making that up. You're making that up. I mean, she might as well have said it was Lululemon. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know, Alex. I wouldn't get too into the weeds here. I don't know. Like maybe just don't even talk about some of this. I just assumed that this world was like Avatar: The Last Airbender. They never specify that if you're not from the water tribe, you can't be a waterbender, but it's so intrinsically linked with your culture that it just seems like that's just the the world that you live in. So yeah, there is a lot of complexity to the world. A lot of it comes and goes as needed. Alex, step one, not to jump right to the suggestions, step one is strip a lot of this out because... As we'll find out as we move through the actual plot of the story, it'll just make everything a lot cleaner at the end of the day. I once had a short story in one of my fiction writing classes that a professor said, this is a good story, but you have too much world building, like secondary world building for a 5,000 word short story. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just too much to explain. Like you can't possibly do it and have a good story. Right. And unfortunately, I think that is the case here as well. It And it sucks to hear that as a writer. I didn't listen, and I tried to keep that story as the same as possible in the final portfolio version, and it bombed because of that. Right. Novels are unfortunately limited by their word counts to a degree, and this is a case where the narrative is suffering because so much of the word count is wasted trying to, like, backfill Absolutely. information. The, the worst thing you can hear as a short fiction writer or any kind of fiction writer is this feels like a piece of a larger work. Mm. And we're just we're, we're telling you that because we love you, Alex. We're we're, we're telling you what you don't want to hear for your own good. And I suspect Alex might respond with something like, oh, well, it is. There's a sequel. But it's like, well, this is a novel. So to some extent, it has to have its own self-contained narrative arc i guess we need to move on to the actual plot of the story (sighs) i guess so (laughs) we open on isla crown in the wildling newlands in an old abandoned greenhouse with her guardians poppy and tara now Isla is mostly confined to her her greenhouse because as we know, she is powerless and people really don't want to see that level of weakness from the queen or the ruler, which is the only term that's ever used to describe them. But she manages to get out using her star stick. And now, Joshua, I got a pop quiz for you. Okay. What does a star stick look like? I don't know. I'm not sure if it's ever <laughs> described. Can I tell you what I was imagining? Please. So when I was a kid, I had this little plastic um, Harry Potter wand that I got <laughs> at like a bookstore. Yeah. And it was it was clear plastic and inside it had a bunch of glitter and like lightning bolt shaped sequins and star shaped sequins and like, I don't know, moons and stuff. Mm-hmm. And also some kind of like gel so that when you turned it upside down, all of the red sand and sequins would float to the top. Ooh, yeah. Um, and it was like Gryffindor themed, I think. So I was imagining that where it's just sort of like a clear plastic kitschy toy that's like maybe two feet long and then you can turn it upside down and then like little sparkles happen. I like that. I like that a lot. So how does it actually look? It doesn't. Oh, that was a trick question. She never describes it. Oh, so I was right. You were right. You, every everything, if, if, whatever you're thinking about what this looks like, that is true. For all we know, every single person's impression of what a star stick is, that is correct. 
I mean, it has to be small, right? Because she hides it in her spine pocket a lot. <laughs> spine pocket, yes. Oh, maybe it's like um chalk zone, where it's just like literally a stick of chalk. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So today is a red letter day for Isla. She is about to embark on her most important mission of life, and that is to participate in the Centennial. So, as we established in our world-building segment, every 100 years, there is a clearing in the storm on the island of Lightlark, and all the rulers of all the realms come together for an event called the Centennial, where they try to break all of the curses according to the prophecy somehow. It's 100 days long, it's a dangerous game. Now, Isla's been training for this a long time. So long. And she's had to because, like we said earlier, she doesn't have powers. Right. So to make up for that, her retainers, Poppy and Tara, who are consistently referred to as guardians in the book, which I find very irritating because there's a word for the thing that they are, which is like personal assistants and trainers to royalty. It's retainers. Abusers. Yeah, abusers, actually. (laughs) Um, They're retainers. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) They retain abuse. (laughs) They've been training her by doing such things as forcing her at the age of 12 to hang from a tree for five hours um, until her shoulders dislocated. But apparently doing this one task, for example, um, has like raised her arm strength stats to max level or something. It's like she's a super saiyan. The book doesn't put it in this, these terms, but it consistently like misrepresents training this way. Like they're definitely abusing her physically and mentally, right? Um, right. But there's these there's these scenes where she'll be having to do some kind of feat of physical spectacle, and she'll flash back to a time that Poppy and Tara abused her really long for one really long time, yes. and it's like, and that's why I have perfect shoulders because <laughs> they stabbed me in the shoulders twelve hundred times a piece. Right until my shoulders were calloused over with an armor-like scar, and now my shoulders are immune to piercing damage, or something like that. (laughs) Right, 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 okay. This this book does not understand how, like, working out works. Anyway, anyway. (laughs) She she teleportals away to Lightlark, and meets up with all the other rulers. There is Azul, who is a Skyling. Celeste, who is a Starling. Cleo, who is a moonling, and Grimshaw, who is a nightshade. Now, we meet later on Oro, the king, the sunling who lives on Lightlark. He is an origin. I really just could only say Avatar in my head because he has the powers of, of everyone else, and he has to live in his little castle or he dies. All is at stake, and like we said, one ruler has to die and their realm with it in order to break the curse of Lightlark. Now, Isla has another secret, and that's that she and Celeste are, like, best girlfriends. Like, you have no idea. Yeah, they, like, meet up and, like, dance together and scream and sing songs. Yeah, and have a pillow fight. Songs. And yeah, it's, it's really weird. <laughs> it's, like, weirdly stereotypical, like, female friend character behavior she has been visiting celeste for a long time because she has the star stick which lets her teleport anywhere except it doesn't so the te- functionally the star stick lets her teleport anywhere right according to the narration she's bad at controlling it so that so so like that attempts to add like stakes to it so like she could potentially miss teleport However, functionally, every time she uses it in the narration, she goes exactly where she wants to go. I, yeah, I don't remember her ever failing. I don't know what the deal is, but she's been visiting Starling Island Town and Celeste for a long time, and they're best girlfriends. So they know each other, and they're planning to ally and solve the Oracle's riddle before anyone else can. But no one else can right. know that. Right, because Celeste knows of an ancient, obscure myth called the bond breaker which is a giant needle that can drain your powers and yeah it'll somehow break the curse without genocide having to happen which sounds like not gonna lie pretty sweet deal love that for them so but they know it's somewhere in light lark 
it's just in some realms library so we we won't talk about this too much in the synopsis but just know every couple of chapters isla will go to some random aisle and look in their library and the bond breaker will not be there yeah and library is really code for like repository of plot devices right where there's just a bunch of like uber uber powerful um ernest klein-esque realm destroying (laughs) magical devices and isla like rifles through them throws them haphazardly over her shoulder as she's like welp not this one and then the chapter ends so we 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 won't give too much time to that but just know they're happening um thus begins the centennial their plan is just be mediocre enough not to get murdered but also not to get any undue attention and that very quickly backfires because isla is a moron for the first 50 days, I think, there is a segment where every ruler proposes demonstrations from all of the other rulers. Yes. The first one is from Grimshaw, or Grim, as we call him. Uh, it is a duel. And that's that's a pretty fun action scene. Yeah, so basically there's like a bracket and all the rulers battle their way to see who's the best at fighting right literally just fighting with a sword no powers so you can you can write this scene in your head in yourself and it'll probably look the exact same way um as it is on the page uh grim and isla quickly form this uh fraught relationship uh grim is very forthcoming about his attraction to isla and they have this scene where they like have a little date on Light Lark where Grimm feeds her chocolates. It's all very, very uh interesting. I mean, he like sexually feeds her truffles in public. Right. Um, which, you know, we've all been there. Which but I just thought it was I should add, should be a huge red flag for Grimm, because a wildling is eating things that are not hearts. And in the book, it says... We don't have to worry about that. Okay, whatever. Fine. There wasn't a single line saying, Isla did not have her powers. So therefore, in that scene, Isla, it doesn't matter whether or not she has her powers. We just, we have to be informed by these zinger lines when to actually care about something. No, I mean, like, Grimm should care because the rules are that wildlings can only subsist on human hearts. So when she's eating a bunch of chocolate... Well, maybe he did the whole time. Spoiler alert. (sighs) Okay, but, but like... Isla, who doesn't know that yet, should be like, wait a sec. Anyway. Right, right, right. So yeah, th- that's another thing is like, Isla has to like hide the fact that she doesn't actually eat human hearts. And it's it's actually kind of fun. She has to like do all these weird things to hide the fact that she doesn't have powers. Most notably when they do like a blood pact and every ruler in the 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 scene has like magic blood and like oros catches on fire or celeste turns into sparkle it's all stupid but anyways um isla's doesn't do anything she's just a normal person right but she like dribbles some rose petals on so people think that like plants grew from her blood <laughs> so i was trying so hard to imagine this scene because this is like a very intimate moment where all the rulers are gathered around a central table, I think it is. Yeah. And they each have to cut their own hand open and their blood, as they pour it together symbolically, like does a little thing. And somehow, with the eyes of these very intelligent people on her, she manages to like shunt some petals out of her sleeve so that they like fall onto her blood puddle right and she's like ah it came out of my hand oh, totally it grew from my blood my magic blood from the powers i totally have and it's like sure, sure whatever yeah. i mean and it, whatever whatever right whatever there's bigger fish to fry there's here. so many there's so many fish So we're going to withhold our comments here because I have a lot to say about these uh, these demonstrations. But the following demonstrations from the duel are a demonstration of everyone's powers, a demonstration of what their realm offers to the good of Lightlark, then a mirror thing with everyone's fears, 
Basically, it's the Boggart thing from Harry Potter. Uh, don't forget the tea ceremony. There's Oro's tea ceremony where the tea leaves spell out everyone's greatest secret. And then there's also Cleo's, uh, where they have to swim through freezing water. Oh, yeah, and she uh, drowns for yeah, no reason. They, they have, okay, so for Cleo's, they have to swim through a maze of freezing water. Um, and the only way to find the end is to follow your heart. Right. And so, like, the test is not getting to the end and finding out what your heart truly desires. It's just sort of following the feeling of your heart to get to the end. Well, okay, so there are a lot of demonstrations, and they're usually done in a chapter or two. Uh, until we get the dramatic reveal from Oro's demonstration with his tea leaves, his tea leaves reveal that he is dying. Dun, dun, dun. And we care about this. We care about this because that means that everyone will die because Oro is to Light Lark what every ruler is to their respective realm. Is it totally clear that everyone is going to die? I, I mean... Either magically or through natural apocalypse, I did kind of think that everyone was going to die. Okay, it wasn't clear to me if that included the Newlands as well, because, like, definitely Lightlark itself is going to die and all the people that live there, but, like, right. the Wildlings also get power from the Wildling Newland. That's made explicit. Well, we saw that Terra is kind of, like, decaying or Poppy, whichever one. True. So I don't know. That's true. Okay, so maybe the world just ends. Let's just assume that the world ends. Okay. Yeah, that's more spectacular. So at the end of 50 days, they each get paired up. Celeste and Isla had been hoping to get paired up by being inconspicuous. Right. But because Isla is stupid and did really well during all of the trials, she gets paired with Oro, which she really doesn't want. But Oro wants because it allows him to kick off his plan, which is another search for a different MacGuffin than the one Celeste wanted to search for. The heart of the island. So now, in addition to the library search, we have these chapters where Oro and Isla go to different parts of the various islands and search for a thing called the Heart of Lightlark. Remember purse plants? Do you remember coffiners? Yeah, the ones that, like, get you? <laughs> yeah, they'll get you. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> yeah, so, like, there's a scene where they go into the woods and there's, like, these plants called purse plants that yeah. are plants that that hold things yep. and they have to open every single one to see if the heart's in there yep. and there's another scene where there's these plants called coffiners that if you get too close to them they'll like grab you and hold you and eat you like a tree that would hold you like a coffin right. they have to open all of them to see if the heart's in there and it's not in either of them so that's just literally wasted time all of these scenes have like the ostensible plausible deniability of oh it's character building between the the love lives of uh isla and oro but all the scenes play out literally the same. Right. Because Isla is just being mean to Oro. Oro is just being mean to Isla. The narrative frames whenever Isla is mean as like really likable, like witty snark, like Marvel-esque yes. levels of like <laughs> smug, smug, smug. But when he does it, we're supposed to think it's mean. Right. And then the scene ends and they've, I mean, you would think they'd be growing apart this whole time because they're just mean to each other. Right, so that's happening, and then as their relationship deepens, through some contrivance, Isla reveals to Oro that she has no powers. Yep. Oro then turns around and reveals it to everyone and decides that he will ally instead with Cleo, who has been kind of framed as the villain evil girl and uh, has, like, been accused indirectly of sending people to murder isla as she tries to search for the bond breaker or whatever the book really wants to set cleo up as like the main villain right anytime she and isla are in the room together she's mean to isla but it, she's mean in like the most childish way where she's like uh eat any good hearts recently wildly <laughs> Right, it's just like microaggressions. And then the then the narration will be like, Isla was hurt by Cleo's snide wit and her, <laughs> her sharp remarks that stung like the barbs of a jillion thousand million roses. And then Cleo will be like, I think you smell bad, Isla. And so that's all we know about Cleo is that right. she says things like that and she's bisexual. Is she bisexual? That's very important that we know she's bisexual. Yeah, she's had... um. She's had women lovers, yes. Oro is like, she's had many lovers, men 
and women. Whoa. To appeal to the woke mobs. Ben Shapiro will have something to say to this. <laughs> Not just Ben Shapiro. I feel like our good old friend J.A. Johnstone would have a thing or two to say about that. Okay. He might. He might. He <laughs> might have something. Where did the Vinderlings show up? Okay, so there's this group of Moonlings at one point that that assaults her yes. in the town. And then we find out later, when Oro saves her, that they were not in fact Moonlings, they were Vinderlings, which is like a offshoot race of Wildlings, who, spoilers, actually did stay on Lightlark the whole time, and are mad at Isla because she's like the, I don't know, the despot queen that like abandoned them or something. Right. That we don't get to hear anything about what they actually believe or what their goals are because she kills them all. They just don't like her. And they are willing to disguise themselves as moonlings and like potentially, I guess, incite like a race war to achieve their goals, which include killing her, followed by question mark, question mark, question mark. Profit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Kill Isla, question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. <laughs> I mean, but presumably, like, if they had been moonlings, that would have, like, really caused international turmoil between the wildlings and the moonlings, right? But, oh, like, yeah. nothing comes of that either. Right. Anyway, so that doesn't matter. Oh, no. Um. Okay, so it, somewhere in here we should mention that Grimm and Isla have, like, sex. Like, really graphic sex. It, it wasn't as bad as Gothicana. Okay, well, it wasn't as graphic as Gothicana, but it was still pretty physical. Yeah, so they end up going to Wild Isle. Oh, right. They find the Place of Mirrors, which is a place where no powers, no wildling powers can work. No, it's no powers except wildling powers. No powers except wildling powers can work. Oh, yeah, and Isla has to hide there because now everyone knows that she's powerless. So after Oro reveals that Isla is powerless, he he eventually comes to her and says... Sorry, I had to betray you because it turned out that the heart of Lightlark was on Moon Isle, the Moon Isle that's in the Lightlark Island chain, that is. Right. And he needed to partner up with Cleo so that he would have permission to go onto Moon Isle and then split off from her secretly and get the heart. So he does that. He gets the heart and he comes to Isla and explains everything. And he's like, I had to betray you. I'm so sorry. And that doesn't make any sense. Obviously, he could have just told her what he was planning. But he's like, no, no, I need your reaction to be authentic. He to, yeah, he made him make it look real. Yeah. Um, and so now they have the heart, and that's good. But what's not good is that the whole thing with the bond breaker is about to pay off. So this seemed like it was something you understood better than I did, because I did, to be honest, get a little bit lost here. All right. Here's what happens. So Celeste is alleged to be poisoned and Azul is accused in this because there was some diamond on her person that uh, Isla had given Azul recently. It doesn't matter. There's like a bunch of jewels on Wild Isle or the Wildling Newlands. Who cares? They try to do like a Danganronpa thing where they're like, ah, it had to be him. Right, right, right. It had to be him. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Obviously, that's not true. Azul did nothing wrong. He is a king we stand. They're, they all end up on wild isle in the place of mirrors and celeste is revealed to have been the villain this whole time this is like um it's not a frying pan it's a drying pan she says this isn't the bond breaker it's the bond maker and you have just given me all of your powers. <laughs> and yeah, so it turns out that she's been like stacking all of the powers to become more powerful right. than even Oro. Because for some reason, she is not Celeste. She is Aurora, the original Starling Queen from way back when, when the curse first started. And there was like a whole love plot between her and Oro's brother, and then also her and Grimshaw's general. Something like that. And Isla's ancestor, and and they're all like tied up in thorns like it's a, a Bond movie or something. <laughs> and Isla's like, 
So you had two women kill my parents and become guardians, shape-shifted into a little girl for years, made two kings fall in love with me, made one of them erase my memories of us hooking up for no reason, which, by the way, Grimm and her had been hooking up this whole time, and he had been erasing her memories for no reason, slightly altered the words of an obscure myth that no one knew about, hired people to kill me only to kill them to save me and sent me on a goose chase across every library in the world. Also, you could become the avatar as a revenge for not being able to marry another king hundreds of years ago because he was in love with my ancestor. And Celeste, who is now revealed to be Aurora, is just like, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, I pretty was, much yeah oldest trick in the book man it was right under my <laughs> nose this whole time i should have seen it coming from a and mile it was totally away. guessable too it if you t- as the reader followed the clues that were so skillfully sprinkled this about the, for you to find this is the hardest single book in the world to summarize because we don't there's no way to predict what's going to be important because okay we uh, <laughs> I, I we're not at the end yet because we can't skip the part where after that whole speech uh isla is like well guess what and i hate that i'm about to make this comparison because it's basically like she's scott pilgrim and she just lost the fight to gideon the first time and she then uses the one up like that scott gets and then like goes back and like kicks gideon's ass in like a cool fight scene but instead she's like oh no i'm tied up but guess what aurora blink and then she warps out with the star stick that she's been keeping in her back yes um she warps directly to her bedroom on the wildling newlands grabs all of her favorite swords and then warps <laughs> back to the place of mirrors and <laughs> just then just her. like attacks aurora a bunch <laughs> with a bunch of swords <laughs> like, <coughs> what <laughs> so that happens um aurora dies now isla is in love with oro and Grimm is scorned and retreats into the shadows of Grim Grimland and Nightshade. And uh, the last chapter is Oro and Isla exploring the place of mirrors, finding the very last vault and realizing the key was Isla's crown the whole time for some reason. We also learn that Isla um, actually does have powers. It's just that she also has nightshade powers because her dad was in nightshade. Ooh. And for some reason, she has the powers of both, even though kids of two different races only get one power set. But that her nightshade powers have been shading oh her God. wildling powers. And now that she's in love with Oro, she also conceivably has sunling powers, but she doesn't know how to access any of them yet. And then it ends. Okay. Wildlings had always been proud of their bodies, beauty, and ability. They had always loved wildly, lived freely, and fought fiercely. Five hundred years before, each of the six realms, Wildling, Starling, Moonling, Skyling, Sunling, and Nightshade, were cursed. Their strengths turned into their own personal poisons. Each curse was uniquely wicked. Wildlings was twofold. They were cursed to kill anyone they fell in love with and to live exclusively on human hearts. They turned into terrifyingly beautiful monsters, with the wicked power to seduce with a single look. Thousands of wildling men and women had been killed off since. Love became forbidden, reckless. Fewer children were born, and daughters had always been more common for their realm. Though love had its various forms, men were killed more often when the rules were broken, and they had slowly become a small community of mostly warrior women. Feared, hated, weak since fewer people meant less power. The Centennial was the only chance to end their curses, to return to their previous glory again, and regain the power they so badly needed. Isla was their only chance. Joshua, do you have anything that you liked about Alex Astor's magnum opus? Yeah, there's a lot I like about the concept, but I suspect that you have stuff to say about that. So I'll I'll bounce off you when we get to that. But I did want to say I have a critique that turns into a like in a classic heel turn of my typical uh, things that I like section. Oh, yes. So I already kind of shat on the like very trite, uh, like female friendship 
that Celeste and Isla have. Mm-hmm. The, the novel just sets it up as like they're the best friends in the world uh we had sleepovers and we gossiped and it's like can you not think of anything any more like specific and interesting than that right but there is a really nice scene when they both arrive on light lark they have this sort of like a moment where they like detail their plan together and celeste is like isla you need to get your head in the game like this is life or death and that was one of the few moments in the book where like i felt like there was like genuine human interaction occurring because Isla has a lot of reason to be really scared and really distracted in this moment. Oh, yeah. And Celeste, regardless of the fact that she's secretly, like, an evil super being, has every reason to, like, really want Isla to get it together. And so the, the something about the timing and the dialogue in that scene was really working, and it made their relationship seem a lot more human and a lot less cliche. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was good. Um, it's really the only actual conversation they have, which I think is a shame, because... They're supposed to be like best friends in the whole world and right. really conceivably Isla's only real friend. It feels like Celeste spends most of her time after that just like chiding her for this, that, or the other thing. That is true. I never really thought about that, but that is the only relationship in the book where I felt like, okay, this is organic. This is not just setting me up for, well, it it was setting me up for something else, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't as naked. It's almost like the book is fabricating a secondary world into which we as the readers are permitted to feel like partakers thereof. Right. Uh, And we can sort of see ourselves in these characters and their human interactions and perhaps learn something from them. And speaking of um, Isla and Celeste relationship, I don't know if you're going to agree with me, Joshua, but like I liked Isla mostly for what Alex tried to do with her, but also for some of the things that were actually done. I've watched a couple of videos about people talking about Light Lark and everyone kind of criticizes the fact that she's powerless. Of course, she's powerless and curseless or whatever. Like, we cannot have a protagonist that's going to eat hearts. Like, she has to be a little bit more relatable than that. But also, on top of that, that gives you really good David and Goliath stakes just to have on a silver platter. I was nervous for her a couple times where she had to, like, fake her powers or she was almost found out as a fraud. I liked the fact that she was stupid. Okay. It was the duel, and she just loved fighting so much that she had to win or she had to be, like, way more impressive than she was trying to be. Obviously, I don't like... As as a person-to-person, that's annoying, but as a character... I can really relate to that and getting like way too into something. And it was just, I didn't mind Isla as a protagonist. Yeah, I wish the narrative had supported that in some way, like been more self-aware about the fact that she's really it, dumb. I thought it was. Celeste only criticizes her for not getting things right. And and I feel like Grimm's also a little bit dismissive. And Oro, obviously, it's been... Um, bickering with her about her childish ways but her winning that fight or losing it on purpose her losing control and letting her guard slip and letting her facade slip ultimately ends up helping her and i feel like that was a moment where the novel could have really punished her for not doing the one thing that she's supposed to be doing right and then she could have learned from it but that's the narrative's fault yeah that's the narrative's fault for making her fail upwards through contrivance that's not internal to her character it's not internal to her character but i think that because it's it's all constructed in that way that they, these mm-hmm. two things aren't ping-ponging off of each other in a way that's benefiting the book so it's hard for me to yeah. really separate her character from that but i can see based on what you're describing like without the actual context of the book the idea of her character being very compelling yeah i agree without any qualifications or asterisks, that her being powerless is an awesome, awesome move mm. on Alex Astor's part. Sure. The novel clearly wants to be more about political intrigue than about actual out-and-out physical conflict. Um, and so I think the idea of having a character that has this secret that if it is revealed, she will be killed, um, along with all of her people, is a really great stake. Mm-hmm. But the, then again, the narrative fails to make us care because we don't really see any of these these people right um that that isla purports to care about and there's really not many moments where like it seems like her secret is going to come out i mean if the other rulers are going to fall for her like sprinkling some cherry blossoms on her blood (laughs) yeah then 
then the threat of her being found out seems extremely not plausible. That that part really, um, I was nervous, but the way she got herself out of that was just so contrived. Speaking of the demonstrations, though, there was one that I really liked, and that was where each nation shows off uh, the, whatever tech they've been developing that can potentially benefit the whole world. You're crazy. You're crazy for putting that in the good section. Oh, well, I thought it was executed pretty boringly, but... Okay, never mind. So, for example, the, the Skylings... They create like a mail system by using jet streams to like move letters. Yeah. And I really thought that was going to come into play. I thought like uh, I was going to start getting like mail that arrived from some mysterious source and it was going to turn out to be Skylings. Um, The Starlings are learning to turn their energy weapons into like permanent metal. So like they're creating matter if a bunch of them get together. And I really thought that was going to come into play, too. Like, there'd be some weapon made out of, like, an unidentifiable metal. But unfortunately, it didn't. But I really loved the ideas there. The, yeah, that's another one of those things, that it works in concept, and it's a cool thing, but then it just exists stuffed into this, I don't know what you, this salad of good ideas that are just not meshing quite well together. It's too many ideas. And speaking of ideas... For all of the stupid twists, I liked a lot of the more straightforward ones. Uh, this is, I, I don't know, I'm i am just not very intelligent, so I, I couldn't sniff out a lot of these twists coming. But when I had the whole Grimshaw-Oro dichotomy in my head, I was expecting Alex to pull a Red Queen and have the dark brooding boy be the good guy while the golden boy was actually like a douche the whole time um and it was nice to see that at least for this one installment i'm sure there will be something else going on where grim actually wasn't the bad guy but it was, it was cool to see it, it play out in a more traditional way I also like the fact that uh, Cleo was just a normal jerk for the most part. <laughs> it's good when characters don't like a protagonist just because they're a jerk. Like, it, it, ha- it doesn't have to be because they're evil. It doesn't have to be because they're some maniacal scheming guy. It can just be this guy's an asshole. But doesn't she have a maniacal scheme? Because, like, she's building a fleet yeah, for some so, but reason. Like, hey, you know, um, before all else be armed. Okay. I, I can't say I was happy about the way, like, I, minorities, especially LGBT people, were represented in this book. They feel like token, and Cleo especially feels like a really bad trope of, like, a catty bisexual woman that I found pretty distasteful. Oh, okay, see, this is cultural context for me, because like, I, I don't know what the stereotypes are for, for I, bi I, women. So I, I certainly don't want to suggest that it's any kind of malice on Alex Astor's part, because, like... Azul is presented in like a totally neutral way. He has a husband and that's mentioned offhand and he's sad that his husband died and that's really it. So I don't want to say that like there's some sort of weird psychological thing going on here, but it just happens to be a confluence of things that creates a trope mm-hmm. that that I just was like, really? I see. Really? Okay. Well then, yeah, I guess I just had that completely flew over my head. So I guess uh, I guess that's kind of null and void. I guess but... if I was feeling charitable, I could say it's meant to make us like her more because like she's catty in a way that could be read as potentially kind of fun, mm-hmm. I guess, if you're feeling charitable. And then the fact that she's bisexual, this would also be tropey, but it might make her seem more interesting. Sure. Which is a, it's a, a positive stereotype, which is still inherently negative, but... You know, I could see the logic of we're trying to make a more interesting character this way by combining these elements. Isla found that she was back on her balcony in a puddle of water. Her hair was dripping wet. Her slip clung to her body, completely soaked through. Her head pounded in pain from its very crown. She was very much alive, not drowned the way she should have been. Which I think is a very funny turn of phrase. Yeah. That person, the one who had been watching her, he must have saved her, then dumped her here, not even bothering to see if she would wake up. Who would do such a thing? I liked the tailor 
apparently there's one tailor for all of Lightlark, and he's just like this magic man who can make scissors fly around and make you the perfect dress in a snap of his fingers. It was a very kinetic and fun scene. I mean, he's literally like Rarity, right? From My Little Pony. Like, isn't that literally what I, that scene is? I don't, I've never watched My Little Pony. Okay, I'm you're so lying. Sorry. You're lying right now. Okay. I've seen three episodes of My Little Pony, right? Just to be clear. And one of them is the one where Rarity sings a little song as she like magically makes a bunch of dresses and scissors and tailory things fly around and she makes a perfect dress for, I don't remember which character it is, probably Twilight. Right. But anyway, yeah, they, they ripped off a scene from My Little Pony, but at least it's a good one. I'll call it a like because it made me smile. Yeah, that's actually all I had to say about that. I just liked him. Okay. Uh, they also have one chocolatier, as we mentioned. And one bartender. And one bartender. The bartender is so funny. I actually hate the bartender, but it's also really funny. So we didn't mention the bartender in our summary because the bartender is not a character. No. The bartender is, in fact, an NPC. Yes. That you go to in a video game when you're stuck in the plot and you need to buy a hint because that's exactly what he does. Um, anytime Isla doesn't know what to do, there's this bartender who's supposed to be all mysterious and all the scenes with him in it are like in sepia tone conceptually. Yes. And like she slyly will like slide information across the bar and then he slyly will slide information back. And so like he's like a dealer in clandestine facts. He doesn't want any money. But actually what's happening is they'll meet in like an alley behind the bar and like T-pose at each other across the alley and Isla will say a thing that is totally unverifiable, but the bartender will just take it as true, and then the bartender will in turn, while continuing to T-pose, say another thing, and Isla will be like, mm, yes, factual, thank you for this information, and then they'll part ways, and that's the end of the scene. Well, Isla's just so trustworthy, you can just look at her and tell. And this seedy underworld information dealer is equally trustworthy and would have no reason to deceive Isla, the queen of a major nation. Well, I kind of conceive of Lightlark as like a resort town, so everything has like this base level of affluence that's way higher than anything that we can conceive of. So like the seediest place in in light lark the worst dive bar is probably like an upscale little gastro pub from somewhere that we're local to that's fair and i think that rides on us not knowing the scale no. of light lark yes. or any of the islands yes. which is maybe a critique but i think it's worth noting that we never get a sense of how big any of these places no. are or how big the populations of any of these places are no absolutely not which wouldn't matter normally but when genocide is on the line does begin to matter a bit. Yes, we will we'll have so much to say about that later on. The genocide arc. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, genocide the genocide arc. Really. Like it's like Attack on Titan or something. No, it's like Undertale, <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> oh, that's so much better. Those <laughs> things totally aren't on the same Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> so this one comes with an asterisk. An Alex asterisk? An Alex asterisk. This one comes with an Alex asterisk. <laughs> um, not as a romance. Keep that in the back of your head the entire time. I liked Isla's relationship with Oro. Okay. Uh, that's probably personal bias. I love bickering. I love nagging. And there was something about them snipping back and forth at each other that I found charming. It was just fun to read in a way. Now, I had a personal problem. This is more of a con where I could only conceive of Oro as like a decrepitly old near death man. Same. He sounds so old. It caught me completely off guard that he was even like a possible love interest. So uh, it did not work as a romance, but I did like reading their scene. So it's a little bit of a paradox. I was literally that. imagining Isla as like 19 or whatever, because it says she's just shy of two decades, I think, in the opening chapter. Yeah, yeah. And then like Oro, I was imagining as like Godric the Grafted from yes! Elden Ring. Yes! But like, no, but like scaled saying... down. So he's like human sized. <laughs> <laughs> like he just like, he's decrepit. He, he's, he's like, tarnished. Kiss me, tarnished. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, it's literally Oro in my head. Um, <laughs> I live in a cool cemetery. It's super <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Do you know how Lightlock was created, Heart Eater? He asked. Her hands curled into fists. 
She couldn't help but feel he was evading her questions, but she preferred him speaking to simply vanishing, so she played along. It was formed... No, that's, that's not her voice. It was formed by Oro's ancestor, the first origin, Ho- Horus Ray. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lie. The island was created by two people, not just Horus, but also Cronin Malvir, my own ancestor. <laughs> Her eyebrows came together. Cronin Malvir. Cronin Malvir. Cronin Malvir. I guess we're going to move on then. Alex, it's about time for your critiques. Um, all right do 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 um, piano piano alex you knew this was coming but we have to move on to the negatives the places where we felt that you fell short of your vision as a writer so joshua you want to start us off with a couple softballs oh boy do i <laughs> so i don't i don't mean this to shame alex i don't want this to come across that way at all um but there's a few like creative writing introduction to level mistakes okay that i i think the book can just get rid of in another editing pass for example there's way 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 too many similes especially things being compared to blades or knives yes so anything anytime like something mean gets said to isla or she gets hurt it's like a knife through her skin it's like a blade against her throat or it's a storm we just need to cut down the similes and when there are similes, we need to think of new things that things can be likened to. Honestly, I would prefer that things are just described as they are in like a creative way. But if we have to have similes, they got to be at least varied. Hey, well, to be fair, Isla's only frame of reference for anything seems to be weapons. So we have to go that off our close point. third characterization here. It's a good point. Um, but for the sake of reading, yeah. it needs to be a little bit varied. If she's such a blade expert... Why can't some of them be like different kinds of blades? Uh, Rapiers, daggers, scimitars, claymores, just to name a few. There are many blades. Um, Also, I know this is something that bothered you, but everything is said twice. Isla was alone, not surrounded by anyone. It's like she, and especially when she starts hitting enter with like one word sentences, and it's just like, synonyms of the previous Mm -hmm. word it's just like it's ridiculous it's ridiculous uh i have more to say about that later on but we can suffice it to say right now it's extremely redundant it really is um and it's just weird it's like trust your reader a little bit more than that like yes people get it they they understand what these things mean you do not trust Um, me alex i am convinced that you think I don't know how to read. Yeah, it repeats itself a lot. And I I totally understand with lore this complicated, Alex's fear of being misunderstood. But I think that that fear would go away if the lore was simplified to the necessary elements. Yeah, right, right. So this is like a compounding issue. Right. Also, the intro is really quick. And I think I know why that is. So in Alex's bio on the dust jacket, it says that she studied creative writing Um, And I think that's true. And I think that like most creative writing programs, she probably learned or was weaned on short stories where it's hammered into you that the inciting incident needs to happen like page one or two so that you can get into the actual action. And I think that she probably made the jump from short story to novel and sort of kept that ingrained learning. Because a novel does not need to have its inciting incident on page four. And yet this one basically does where Isla dumps exposition for four pages or so, and then immediately jumps onto Light Lark. And it is way too fast. And in a novel this long, you can slow it down. And let's take this as a sandwich. This is why there is absolutely no denouement in this story. Mm. There is a lot of stuff dangling at the very end, just like how she jumped right into the action at the very beginning. There's a lot of stuff at the very end that is dangling way too far down to be sequel bait. Stuff like, uh, how does Isla make peace with Cleo now that all this has been a big misunderstanding? What is the resolution between all the rulers in general? 
what is she going to do with Tara and Poppy now that she knows that her whole life has been a lie? There's the grim thing that's kind of hinting at a sequel, and then there's stuff that is not worth shoving over into another installment. You probably should at least give a paragraph to talk about it. Mm, yeah, for me, the big one was, do all the starlings die? Yes! Did every starling die? Did she just murder all of them? That didn't get addressed within the, the bounds of this particular book, and it's a particular particularly striking because Isla makes another starling friend over the course of this book. Yes. She's assigned like a servant as a resident of Castle Lightlark. Uh -huh. And that servant is a starling. So like did that did that person just die? Like when when uh, Aurora died because like even though Aurora was hiding her identity, she was still the actual ruler of Starling. So like she should have killed everyone when she died right yeah right right i thought that's how that worked that's in my notes bolded and underlined is every starling dead now we don't know yeah and that's not something that i think can just be left there is a difference between leaving stuff open for a sequel and not answering very important questions yeah and this could have been lampshaded really easily like isla could have been like oh my god did all the starlings just die and is it my fault i don't know right and yeah then, yeah, yeah then it would be okay if the book ended because like we know that we're not supposed to know as readers but we don't get that closure or, god even a deus ex machina be like oh no because aurora was evil and over the age of 25 she didn't count as the starling's real ruler and it was actually ella the whole time she was the secret <laughs> princess uh it was something it doesn't have to be schindler's list you can just say all the starlings were not summarily murdered by this one action and I would be satisfied. So yeah, that's a very good point, Joshua. Sometimes this book just doesn't know what words mean. So like <laughs> okay. the centennial is consistently referred to as a game where like the rulers are competing to solve the oracle's riddle first. But like it's not a game. There's no level of competition involved. I mean, they're trying to solve it as quickly as possible, but like ostensibly they're all working together more or less if they kill each other and they kill the wrong person then the quote-unquote game ends so like it's really not a game at all it's more like i don't know a puzzle um also appear the book keeps saying the light lark appears every hundred years but it doesn't appear the storm around it goes away like it's always there it appears through the veil of rain you can always see it like Anyway, that's that bothers me. And temptress is another one that really bothers me. The wildlings are referred to as temptresses, even though we know there's men wildlings, presumably other gendered ones as well. So they're not all women. And also they're not tempting people to fall in love with them so that they can eat their hearts. The eating of hearts is an incidental and regrettable side effect of falling in love. So they're not deliberately trying to trick anybody. Well, that's the stereotype. Yeah, but Isla calling them that doesn't make any sense unless she has, like, in internalized racism. She might. I mean, I kind of just took it facetiously. Like, she was, oh, these wildlings were vile temptresses. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was able to hand wave it. This might be my poetry brain putting too much weight on individual nouns like that, but it's it really bothers me because, like, they're not temptresses. They're just people mm -hmm. trying to live. And when they fall in love, these terrible things happen. They're they're not they're not trying to seduce people. They're not two faced. I don't know. Well, hey, she has a lot to grow for the second one, where she becomes one of the woke mobs and attends Kelton College. Oh my god, <laughs> Kelton College! You remembered the name. I'm so impressed. <laughs> of course I do. Um, I forget all the books we read, um, oh except god. for Handbook for Mortals, Plain White Tees, Jackson. If you're listening, hit me up. Lanny Sarum, please finish. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One phrase kept popping into my mind. I probably stole this from somewhere, but I, I it just kept coming up. Economy of description. Mm, interesting. Every scene, every concept, everything executed seems to be built around what would require the least amount of writing and description possible the worst offenders of this are probably the trials and demonstrations or whatever the hell they were there's a duel and that's fine and then everything else is they are sitting around 
and doing magic tricks. Oh yeah, there's a lot of prestidigitation. This is billed as Akatar meets Hunger Games. There's nothing really kinetic or frenetic or exciting about these trials. They're just doing magic tricks when they're not fighting with swords or swimming. Um, probably the worst one for me was the mirror scene. And I know there's the auxiliary purpose of they need to get a glove made of human skin with magic powers or whatever. It doesn't matter. Don't worry um, to get to the library. Yeah, if that sounds exciting, uh, no. club members, don't worry. It's not. It's not exciting. They just need some DNA for their magic human skin gloves. It, it's one and done. Um, that's where I was like, holy crap, Alex just did not want to write this because you just have this interesting concept of a fear mirror and i know it's just a boggart but whatever forget about that right now um we just sit around and ponder what might be happening with all of the other rulers we get no physical description nothing shows up in the mirror nothing's really described in terms of like their reactions to this per se and then it's isla's turn and her fear is being stuck in her room from chapter one there's nothing there. Yeah, there's no there there. There's no there there. Uh, and then there was, um. so Oro and Isla are searching for the heart of whatever. And Joshua talked about this, how it's like a CDI uh, Legend of Zelda game. Um, they talk about this ancient creature with with amazing knowledge. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh, are they going to meet a sphinx? I thought it was going to be a centaur. Are they going to meet a centaur? Are they going to meet some wise creature? That's interesting that we both went half human. That's interesting, but but different directions. But it's a freaking ghost. Oh, yeah. It's a normal woman, but like see-through. It is literally a dead lady. Because you're like, oh, I don't want to describe a, a an interesting creature. I'm going to have a ghost. I don't want to describe all of the rulers facing their fears. I'm just going to have them stare at a mirror. I, I'm mad, Alex, not because I think you're a bad writer, but, but because I'm so frustrated because I know you can do better. I actually want to disagree about the reason for that choice of having them just look in a mirror. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's out of a... I, I kind of generally agree with you, actually, about the economy of description where it's about describing something quickly and easily. But in this particular case, I think that the reason we don't know what they see in the mirror is because we're supposed to be drawing excitement and suspense from not knowing what the thing is. And I think the novel is setting up and then failing to deliver upon Isla guessing what the fears are and then using that against the rulers. Because there's so much talk in this book about, ooh, there's secrets, ooh, there's duplicity, ooh, there's like things I have to figure out and then use against people. What is that? Blackmail. But then it never happens, and I think this is just another case of that, where it's like, presumably Isla is going to figure out what Oro's greatest fear is, which is, I, I think it's dying or whatever. And then she's going to be able to, like, use that against him to get Cleo on her side, for example. And then Cleo is going to temporarily align with her, but then what's that? Cleo knows something she doesn't know. It's going to betray her. Oh my god, now she has to go back to Celeste, but she can't be too close to Celeste because they're not supposed to know each other. Um, and, and that's kind of what this novel is promising, but then it doesn't actually do that. Yeah, I mean, that you you said it right there. It doesn't do that. And even if it did do that, I would have preferred a scene where I wasn't constantly told, ooh, what could he possibly be viewing in his fear mirror? <laughs> let, let me do the work for you. Like, talk about economy of description. You could have taken away all the pondering. I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I can only assume that Aster just didn't feel like doing anything. So she just wrote a scene where they're doing magic tricks in, in turns or looking at a mirror. Oro would do something and then Isla will think, why did Oro do that in the next freaking line? It drove me insane. There's all these little, little seeds. And I feel like... You did some editing, Alex, and didn't follow through. Either you didn't edit the thoughts or you didn't edit the actions. One or the other was missing, and it, you could really feel that 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 friction there. 
I wonder if Alex was editing by like topic. Ooh, yeah. Like for example, if she's editing by like by like Isla's character arc and she's thinking, oh, okay, Isla wants to be strong and then she later for some reason feels guilty about how she wishes she were strong and she learns that power is not something to be lusted after even though in her case power is something that would be very sensible to want because it would protect her quite a bit and so then she has to learn that she doesn't even need power and then like somehow along the way as she was trying to make those progressive edits she didn't edit all of the actions properly or didn't edit all the thoughts properly like you were saying and to be fair in a book this long i can kind of understand overseeing things but that's why there's editors and it makes me wonder why the editor didn't catch this stuff i wonder if it's because this book blew up so quickly on tiktok that that the publisher or some other corporate pressure on alex was trying to get her to get this out ASAP so that the buzz wouldn't die down. You hit the nail on the head. I don't want to talk too much about the controversy, but I think Alex absolutely was the victim here. She she blew up on TikTok way too soon. The the book was not ready and the editors didn't care. They wanted to capitalize as soon as they could. Yeah, cuz I after I read this, um I had heard that Alex was also a middle grade writer and so I looked at reviews of her middle grade books and they're generally pretty positive. So I was surprised that she wrote something this bad. Right. Well, um, and I, I wonder if it was it's just a factor of time. It's bad in the way you don't want a salad with, uh, I don't know. Tomato is a fruit, but you wouldn't put them in a fruit salad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tomato. Yeah, that's perfect. It's bad in the way tomato is a fruit, but you wouldn't want to put it in a fruit salad. Like there, every constituent part works. It's the the putting them together that that really causes the problems so i i would be interested to see what the fraught relationship if hey alex if you want to have an interview like with lanny and just tell it all and lay it all on the line totally open to that i alex yes please do come on we would love to talk to you i doubt it'll happen because i think that you probably are afraid of potentially negative press which is fair you've faced a lot of criticism for this but if you're interested in talking we're interested in hearing what you have to say grim is worse than steve from empress Teresa. grim is worse than vad deverell and i never thought i would say that grim is worse than vad deverell, vad deverell who is who is still camped out outside my window i have to say <laughs> um he i don't even need to set an alarm anymore because vad deverell is there at the crack of dawn tapping on my window <laughs> like please i have an english lecture for you it's about the concept of music and how it interacts with the history of literature steve just wasn't funny grim is a sex pest oh i also wrote that word in my book really <laughs> yeah i wrote sex pest several times it's on so the pages of my everything book. he says is so weird everything he says is so weird so uncalled for so not attractive that i could not take him seriously as a love interest. Okay, wait, I have a thought. Okay. So Grimm knows that he erased all of her memories, but like mentally, he still has those memories. So he's uh -huh. still at a place where he can say cringe ass shit to her. Yes. And, and, and if they were in a committed relationship, like it would be cringe ass shit, but they would both be okay with it. But like, she doesn't remember it. Right. And so like, she's not, she's not bouncing off. She's not yes anding him. Like, do you think that maybe that's what's happening? If we're being charitable? I do feel inclined to be charitable. However, that does not change the fact that we don't know that for the first 90% of the story. And we're just watching him be a creep to this woman who has to be younger than 25. Not only is she 19 and him, like, at least 500. Yes, he's um, 500! He, he also was involved with one of her ancestors, so... Yes! but we don't know that until the very end too so that just complicates things even double over so she's less than a child to him but he's licking his lips and rubbing his hands together like the guy in the gillette ad jesus christ so yeah um i don't really know what the solution is there alex but holy crap it was a little a uh, little much a little it was a lot much it was a lot of much this is a question but it will probably, upon answering, become a negative. Joshua, 
what is the nature of Isla's relationship to Tara and Poppy before the twist? Because in chapter one, it felt like they were all giggly, but they were kind of nervous, but they were still giggly and talking about each other's hair and stuff. And then for the rest of the book, without any real commentary on it or emotion behind it, Isla will say like, oh, this challenge happened, but I was prepared for this because of this extremely hyper-specific torture that Poppy and Tara put me through. So what's the nature of their relationship? Yeah, like, are, th- are they friends? Like, Oh, okay. I can sum it up for you in three words. Child abuse. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess. But like, I, I don't know. It was it, it caught me so off guard in ch- from chapter one to any of the other chapters talking about their relationship. It was just like, wh- where did this come from? I The thing is, um, I don't have an answer, but I do have a vaguely funny a joke. Uh, I don't think Alex Astor has ever seen an anime, and I suspect that if she were to watch one, she would disintegrate into dust. But um, this is so anime core, right? Like that—that that she's like, ah, I've been training for this moment all along. I remember, I remember when Kakashi tied me to a pole and made me look for magic bells he hidden on his person. Like I don't know, I don't know. Like it is so hyper specific, and it's uh, bizarre. It's just like that time when Guts Berserk had to cut his arm off. It's just like that time when Gone Hunter X Hunter had to fight. A guy who every time he got punched by that guy, it put him into power level debt. And if he let the debt get too high, he would run out of power level. Okay, so what we're getting at is um, you got to work on this relationship between Isla and her guardians, Alex, because there, there's clearly some inconsistencies here. Yeah, it's like weird physical abuse she she gets put through by them. But then like she talks about it in the most positive terms yeah. possible. Okay, so like the the small brain, oh, it's a plot hole kind of critique of it is, eh, it's a plot hole. But the big brain critique of that is, it's a missed opportunity for character complexity. Naturally, I mean, inevitably, Isla would have a complicated relationship with these two women. Um, she might like them because she's been Stockholm Syndrome into liking them. But she would also probably hate them and resent them for, I don't know, ripping her shoulder apart that one time that they did that. So she might feel compelled to save them when one of them is being, I don't know, subsumed by the very soil. But she might also feel maybe a little bit like, oh, I'll let her die because I hate her. <laughs> which is which is what happens, to be fair. She she says all of those things. It just I, I, I feel like it wasn't given the weight it was it was due. Uh, she says it, but like, I don't believe. Yeah, it's it, there's no weight. I don't believe her. <laughs> I right. guess. Right. <laughs> I think you're lying. Like, I don't know. I read that. And I was like, Isla, I think you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Pop quiz number two, Joshua. What did Grimm look like in your head? Um. Okay. Uh. Take a shot. This is like the seventh Elden Ring reference, but Blyde. The wolf man? Yeah, Blyde. Just Blyde. He was just Blyde. He had a wolf head and everything, and there was no explanation for that. Okay, you're you're insane. Um, No one will get this reference but i need to say it because it affects the way that i uh i viewed grim and i don't know why it, the, alex this probably isn't your fault i'm just gonna say it he looked like the vampire dad from scary godmother in my head that old cartoon network cartoon oh, he man. was just this i really thought you were gonna say hotel transylvania well uh, him too i uh, like he was just like an old bald vampire freak and like i just <laughs> could not conceive of him as being attractive like it was just god every time every time he does something sex pesty the rest of the characters are like ah uh, nosferatu yeah, right exactly exactly look like nosferatu <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm not like this this is a this is a stupid criticism alex i'm not literally saying that this was a problem but like i don't know i feel like more physical description of the characters were due to really sell the fact that like this was like a hot guy and not like an old 500 year old man like how i thought oro looked like okay uh pop quiz number 17 okay uh cleo what does she look like to you um (sighs) daenerys targaryen from game of thrones but like meaner okay all right i can see that silver hair woman okay that's it. <laughs> I was imagining like stereotypical depictions of Cleopatra, but if she was like reskinned to have like ice colors, so like white and and like kind okay. of a frost blue, 
And gold. No, I'm with it. Oro gave her a strange look. You haven't been sleeping well, have you? She asked, leaning toward him, squinting at the purple beneath his eyes. She expected him to ignore her question like he had before, but he said, No, I haven't, for a long while. Her voice, surprisingly, was gentle, not judgmental, the way it always had been with him. Oro looked at her tree, its fruits ripe and swollen with juice and so heavy the branches dipped. I have a lot of guilt, he said quietly. That keeps me awake. Guilt. She knew the word intimately. So aside from all that, I think because this novel clearly wants it to be a game, I think that this this curse and this prophecy and all of these other layers of rules that are all being made by different people should be consolidated into one one tier of rules, right? Because like there's the curse, which is made by one person. There's the prophecy that's made by a second person. And then there's the rules of the centennial, such as like them partnering up, which is made by a third set of people. Um, I think that all of that should be made by a single mastermind. Like a what this what this novel needs is like a Monokuma type character who is sadistic and wants to see these people suffer and therefore made this curse, gave a cryptic riddle about how to fix it, and then created a set of rules for things that the people have to follow while they're trying to figure out how to follow the set of rules in the prophecy to solve the curse, right? This this book needs like a sadistic mastermind type. And I I hesitate to say that because it sounds a bit cliche and it sounds a bit oversimplified to sort of consolidate all this stuff. But I think it would solve a lot of it would, I mean, it would cut a lot of fat, right? If there was one guy, we don't even have to know who that guy is necessarily. It can even be one of the rulers. I mean, maybe it should be one of the rulers who's pretending like Aurora to be somebody that they're not. Joshua, Joshua, Joshua. Yes, yes, yes. I can, I can fix this for you in two words. This was my number one suggestion to Alex, and this is the exact same thing that you were saying. Okay, go for it. I got two words for you. The orb. Like from Ready Player One? Like from Ready Player One. So, like you said, it's gotta be a sadistic mastermind. There needs to be some kind of personification of the centennial, of the curse, everything you said. Consolidate the three different, like, things about this whole book into one uh, entity, right? Like you, like you Yes. It's been said a million times. This is Hunger Games meets Akatar. Who or what is the capital? And I was thinking about this. Exactly. Thank you. Who's President Who's Snow, President right? Snow? I was thinking about this and I'm like, okay, Alex is someone who doesn't want to describe a mythical creature, would rather have it be just some woman than anything cool. So let's just have it be an orb. And then... All of these stupid arbitrary rules about what happens at day 25 and day 50 can just be hand waved. Oro could be like, yeah, sorry, bro. Um, there's got to be a ball at day 75. Orb said so. Orb told us we had to all come. Just it doesn't have to be sensible or hard to describe or a compelling character. OK, even. is there somebody behind the orb or is the orb just god it's the the orb was created by the curse oh okay. keep everything the same it's it's aurora who started it but like the orb was created by the the energy or whatever stupid magic crap and they have to do it they're they just don't question it the orb will literally kill you if you don't okay yeah no i like that there's a real tangible threat we can have a disposable character uh disobey the orb at some point and just like disintegrate on the spot Sure, yeah, 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 whatever. All of this stuff is just made up. It just blinks, and people think it's like Morse code, and they've tried to dis decode it, and that's why all of these uh, rules are so bad and dumb. That's very tarot-like, right? Like, you, you're you just looking for patterns? Yes! Holy crap! I didn't even do that on purpose. It's exactly tarot-like. Yeah. There's just these, like, sort of patterns and broad themes, and you're just looking to make connections, and so no matter what you draw, if you think about it long enough, you can make it make sense for you. The orb, Joshua, it's the key to all of this. I hope it's capital T, capital O, every single time. It is capital T, capital O. <laughs> oh, okay, so, like, Ella, right, who's, like, the starling servant, yeah. who kind of becomes Isla's friend, sort of? Sure. Um, 
like what if she's like a crazed fanatic Ooh. who is she she's about to die right because in the book she's like in her early 20s right so what if she's like the orb told me i led that if i kill you then i'll save my race because you're the one that has to die yeah, yeah and then none of my people will die and also i'll get to live past 25 and but but she says that really early on and she's like but the orb told me i have to do it in a really specific way at a specific time and you'll never know <laughs> and i can't just get a different servant she's stuck with ella right there's, and so there's like no th there's like there's like a tension and like they still have to hang out <laughs> um and it's even maybe in Isla's interest to stay close to Isla more often. I love that. That's genius. There does not have to be a physical personage associated with this thing other than the reveal that it was Aurora the whole time. Everything can just be the same. And I just, I'm aching for a scapegoat to point my fingers at for these dumb rules why do they need to form alliances at 50 days why can no one kill each other before 50 days why do there need to be demonstrations why 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 the easiest way to answer these questions is just to say because the orb said so and if we don't listen to the orb we die <laughs> It's definitely more tangible than a council at the first centennial 500 years ago decided that we need to split up into pairs because it would reduce the chance that we kill each other. Exactly. Uh, that's like, very boring. And arbitrary. Also, like, to, to sort of circle back to the part about it being a game. Yeah. It's, it's not a game because if it was a game where people died, people would have died in previous centennials, but we know that they haven't because if they had races would have been wiped out and they would talk about it right and so for 500 years nothing has happened basically it's been a stalemate uh if we're using game terminology but an orb would indeed fix that what if instead of an orb it was like a floating transparent woman sure okay yeah it can be a floating transparent <laughs> woman but that's three words where orb is one so a floating transparent woman who wanted to possess uh, Isla's beautiful body so that she could make out with the king for 30 seconds. You really hate my orb that much, but yeah, I, okay, I see where you're coming from. No, I don't hate your orb. I just wanted to make sure that, that club members knew that's what the ghost wanted to do. <laughs> no, that is exactly what the ghost wanted to do. <laughs> this is a softball. This is the softest ball in the entire world. This is pillowy, Alex. Please, God, Please, God, I beg you, just one accessory knife. It can be the headband. It can be a, a hair clip. I don't care. Just have it be one thing. Oh, okay, okay. It got to the point of ridiculousness where every single accessory that Isla owns is a knife. And she at one point had like a cape made out of chain mail. Yes. That is not that's not feasible it would be so heavy so strip it out and then you can sell like um let's say it's a let's say it's a hairband sell hairband knives as like merch and you're golden <laughs> right like it's just uh, like come on yeah the fact that it's in a different spot every time you know i didn't think about that but you're right like she always makes a point of saying like i had a knife concealed here and here and here and here and it's like usually in different places and it's like yeah if it was just one and it can be the one that uh, Celeste gives her as part of her master plan, too. Sure. Who cares? I don't care where it is. I don't care what it is. It just needs to be a single part of her body, a single accessory that she wears. Um, because I just it, it, it was funny. And I don't think you wanted it to be funny how many knives were on this woman. Uh, while we're serving softballs on silver platters like the head of John the Baptist, in a similar vein, I think that uh, the, the star stick should also be in a single location at all times. And we should know where that location is. Sure. Because all the time Isla's wearing these like sexy skimpy outfits with nothing covering her back, right? And yet she, whenever she pulls the star stick out, she's pulling it out of her spine area and so it's like where how she has it um, clenched yeah is she clenching her shoulder blades all the time <laughs> like she's doing rows that's the kind of thing that i would think an outfit savvy book would would be interested in explaining because the book is outfit savvy or you could play it for comedy 
if you don't feel like explaining it, you could play it for comedy. Oh, like it's in hammer space or mouth space, whatever it's called. Sure, I I don't know what that means, but sure. You know how in like uh in cartoons, characters can pull mallets out of nowhere, like in Looney Tunes or whatever. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, it's called like hammer space or whatever. Okay, yes, exactly, hammer space. The star stick. I feel like we could talk about the star stick forever. I know, doesn't make any sense. It's like an infinite use, instant teleport to wherever you want, but ostensibly it doesn't work, but functionally it always does. I don't know. I think the problems with that are pretty obvious. I trust our club members to get it. <laughs> um, Alex, I know you don't want to hear this, but I want you to hear it from me. Uh, the names are all stupid. I'm sorry, but, but they are. Every single name for every person, place, or thing in this story is either the most obvious thing ever or Dora the Explorer level Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's this concept in um <clears throat> of comedy called um two stepping. So in a scene you get uh, two suggestions from the audience. Let's just say as a random crazy example, you ask for two suggestions and you get the words island and crown. <laughs> huh. Where will he go with this? What you don't want to do, Alex, what you don't want to do is begin the scene and say, hello, my name is Island Crown. Like I am destined to become the ruler of all the, the islands. islands. Right. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's really bad. It's insulting. Uh, it's every single word you could think of. It, it drove me insane. Cronin Malver. Horace Ray is the the shining king of the the island. The gold island. Pronan Azul is the king of the sky. Oro is golden. Like Celeste is the stars. Like, come on, Alex, you're smarter than this. We're smarter than this. The one that bothered me most was actually Lark Crown, Isla's mom. Not because it's like bad necessarily but because lark crown is so hard to say because you have to pause to make sure you hit both cuss sounds when you say lark it lark crown like sonically it is poison <laughs> hey maybe it sounded better in translation in the um in the language they speak on light lark maybe it, it works better on the tongue maybe so by two-stepping what i mean is if you have to have this very very direct etymology at least corrupt it a little bit that's why the main character of the Hunger Games is named Katniss and not Candace, or or Peta and not Peter. Let's say uh, okay, so Isla Crown. Uh, let's let's corrupt uh, Ilya Rona with two R's, so it can be a reference to that guy that you're talking about in the dedication. It could be like a little cute thing for your boyfriend, fiance, husband. Just. Take it one step further than the most obvious freaking choice in the entire planet. Yeah, it has like a, a logic to it that's like a little bit too associative. And like you want readers to feel the excitement of making the connection. But if it's too obvious that they could get it just by glancing at it, it loses that effect. Exactly. And it just becomes uh, juvenile is the word coming to my mind for this. I just come on. I think Elia, maybe if it starts with an E, and then, yeah, like, Rona or something. I mean, Rona sounds like what people call COVID, but right. something along those lines, like, is, is, is in the right direction. No, but you should not take my stupid random suggestion to heart. I just mean, like, something along those lines. Yeah, or maybe some other name that, like, suggests something about her personality i don't know that's what those like baby name websites are for right yes. like go to those baby name websites pick a name and then corrupt it a little bit like in terms of spelling it doesn't have to be that hard you'll be golden that's all i want from you alex that's all i need then you'll be oro then you'll be oro <laughs> <laughs> does he have a last name no do any no, of them have only, last names only isla has a last name huh. and then the random like um historical figures like horace ray cronin malvair and L light lark light. Or whatever her name <laughs> light is lark. It's lark crown <laughs> oh i'm so sorry 
do you think there is a character named Light? I mean, if there's a character named Lark, I, I and 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 Isla's like genealogy is responsible for making the island in part. No, stop talking, Alex. I'm begging you. Do not create a character named Light. They'll probably be named like Illumis or something. That's better. That is a better name. <laughs> Are you sure, King? She said. It seemed you and the Wildling were getting along so swimmingly. Oro matched Azul and Celeste next, then Isla and Grim. But she barely heard his voice over the roaring. Her body hardly resisted, barreling over the table and slicing the King's throat with his own crown. The realization hit her like a boulder to the chest. Oro had been using her. Up until she had become useless, now that they knew the heart was on Moon Isle, he had changed alliances to suit his plan. He had chosen Cleo. For the entire time she had known him, every choice Sorrow had made was for the good of his people. I will do anything it takes to break these curses, he had said, even if it meant betraying her. Are you really sure, King? Cleo said, staring at Isla with pursed lips. I have to admit I'm suspicious. This isn't just a strategy between you and the wildling, is it? A sprig of hope grew in Isla's chest. They had worked together for weeks. She had saved his life. He had saved hers. Maybe he wasn't betraying her. Maybe this was a strategy. Oro's smile was pure mirth. I'll let you in on a secret that might explain my decision, he said loudly for all to hear. He turned to look straight at her. Isla Crown does not have powers. The world froze. Well, Alex, I know that we were probably a little bit more negative than you were hoping for, but just rest assured, I had so much fun reading this story. I I just feel rejuvenated. This is the exact kind of book that this podcast was made for. I had no fun reading this book. In fact, it was a miserable experience that I thought was going to translate into a miserable podcast recording session. But it turned out that because it's it's right in just the right ways and wrong in just the right ways, that talking about it was actually a blast. Yeah, it's very, very cathartic. I wish you all the best. I can't wait for um, Life Sword, the uh, person on Instagram who I had mentioned talking to, thought that your sequel's name was Nightboat, and I really, really want the sequel to be Nightboat. I know that it's supposed to be Nightbane, but Nightboat is such a funnier title that I, I kind of want that to be, like, spoken into existence. Yeah. Um, I can't wait for it. Uh, I can't say that I want it more than I want the sequel to Handbook for Mortals, but it's a close second. <laughs> uh, I yeah. think that you are a perfect addition to our club, and I hope to see you every every future episode. Yeah, I hope you'll be here every week because I feel like we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, as Andrew's been saying, this is really the perfect kind of book to review on this on in our club, um, and I, I think that there's a mutually beneficial. Uh, relationship to be had here because i think that in in trying to help books like this we both learn a lot as well as critique partners absolutely yeah i i really appreciate how much you put yourself into the story how many ideas that you put into the story even if they don't all mesh quite the same and even if they cause problems when put together i know that there was genuine passion and genuine talent that went into writing this you know, Andrew, there's this adage that I once heard about creative writing, and I think I even heard it from you, maybe. And I think it's originally from George R. R. Martin, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it goes that, you know, the ideas are, are the easy part. It's the execution that's hard. And that's certainly true. But I think that there's something to be said about a book like this that has such a wealth of ideas. Like there's so many different ideas for lore and world building and, and character creation in this book that to 
simply discount the book because there's too much is to do a disservice to like the amount of creative zeal that went into the initial draft. I just don't think that we should take ideas for granted in that way, personally. And I think we should celebrate when a book has a lot of ideas. Because it's clear when it doesn't, you end up with like a Ready Player One. Yes, yes. <laughs> Where you have no original ideas at all. And you're just like saying things that other people already thought of. Well, take that home with you, Alex. You're better than Ernest, so... Anyways, I've been your host, Andrew. And I've been Joshua. Thank you for listening to another episode of the English Club podcast. You can find us where you're listening now, as well as Spotify, YouTube, any other hosting platform. We are available on Instagram and Twitter, or you can email us at englishclubpodcast at gmail.com. Make sure to share any suggestions, whether that be for books or improvement of the quality of our episodes. Just keep in touch with us. I love talking about these dumb books with you guys. So anything you feel is worth a, worth a conversation about, feel free to slide into our DMs. Yeah, the interactions on Twitter, Instagram, and email, um, and in our YouTube comments have been a delight so far. Uh, the critiques as well as the people just enjoying our content, uh, we really appreciate all of it. I know I said that at the start of the episode as well, but we really do mean it. It, it just is really heartwarming to see people engaging with the thing that you made. As always, our music is by Benjamin Davis or Public Domain where applicable, and uh, we will see you guys around campus. Isla climbed onto the railing the same way she had the first day of the centennial, when she had sung the song that had drawn Oro out onto his own balcony. He was behind her, an endless source of heat. Her feet kicked air high above the churning sea. She looked up at him. Don't let me fall in. His eyes met hers. Never, he said. Isla glared at him. Never again, he amended. And they all live happily ever after, dot, dot, dot. Or do they? (laughs) Or do they? (laughs) Oh. Here, spit out my beer.